for an entire generation. People have experienced Star Wars the only way it's been possible, on the TV screen. But if you've only seen it this way, you haven't seen it at all. This is the podcast you're looking for. We've been waiting for you. Hi, this is Martha Wells, author of Razor's Edge. And you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z and Corey Club. This is the podcast you're looking for. Your insight serves you well. We would like to welcome Martha Wells as our special guest. Martha is the author of Razor's Edge, Delroy's newest Star Wars novel. The book is centered around Princess Leia and takes place between episodes 4 and 5. This is truly the novel that Leia fans have been clamoring for, and we are thrilled that Martha has agreed to join Corey and me for a cup of coffee. Welcome, Martha. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely, and um, on our show, of course, Coffee with Kenobi, we're big fans of books and literature, and we like to look at things through a critical lens. Uh, and we're excited to have uh, a writer with the talents of yourself on our show. So if you could, tell us your background as a writer. Uh, well, I've been writing for about 20 years. Um, I was first published in 1993 by Tor Books. My first novel was a fantasy novel called The Element of Fire. And uh, since then, I've done uh, quite a few fantasy novels in different series. Uh, my Ilrian series and uh, The Books of the Rexera is the most recent one. I've done Young Adult Fantasy. Uh, my latest young adult fantasy was Emily in the Hollow World, which came out uh, earlier this year. And I've also done uh, two other tie-in novels for Stargate Atlantis. So that's I know, much- that's awesome. I really enjoyed that, I, I especially that's, that was one of my favorite shows, so I really enjoyed writing the books for it. And I've been a Star Wars fan since I was 13 and first saw the movie in the theater. Oh, sweet. That's great. That's that's wonderful. I, I You and I kind of talked a little bit off the air, and... Uh, I was overwhelmed by the body of work you've got. You've got quite a few titles under your name, and this is your first Star Wars book. How did you become a Star Wars fan? When I first saw it in the theater, uh, that was back, I get, I, it was, I think it was 1977. Absolutely. And, yeah, there was just nothing like it out there. And I'd been reading science fiction and fantasy you know, since I was a little kid, and I actually had found the book first, the, the, the Alan Dean Foster, where mm. I, I it was the one that was, I think that he ghost wrote it. It was actually by, it was labeled as by George Lucas. I read the book first and really fell in love with it. And it was a while before I was able to actually see the movie because my, my parents didn't take me to a lot of movies. So I finally got to see it and ended up seeing it nine times in the theater. Wow. And it was just such a huge experience. It's kind of hard, I think, for, for, you know, kids now to realize, you know, we'd never seen anything like that. The other movie that we hadn't really seen a you know a science fiction action movie a space opera like that with with such good special effects at the time so it was just a it was just had a huge effect on me. Well, and a space opera is a, is a beautiful way to say it. And that's and that's some of those archetypes and the great classic strong moments that are in Star Wars and the whole the whole yeah. saga really. Um, so it's really neat for us to know that how great for all of our listeners too that we have a real. Star Wars fan who gets to write Star Wars fiction. So how did the book Razor's Edge come about? That must have been quite a thrill for you. Yeah, it really was. Um, I wasn't expecting anything like that. Lucas Books had uh, contacted, I guess, different different agents. I contacted my agent to ask about uh, people who are primarily science fiction or fantasy authors who might be interested in doing a Star Wars novel. And she she gave them my name along with some others, and they picked me and uh, asked me to do the uh, you know a book about Leia, and that would be set between Star Wars and The Empire Strikes Back, and that's really my favorite you know period of Star Wars because that was the one you know I really I really kind of grew up during those three years you know we were waiting for waiting extremely anxiously for The Empire Strikes Back to come out, and then anxiously for Return of the Jedi to come out. But um, so that was my favorite period. So I just yeah it was just. It just came out of the blue, and it was so exciting. It was, it was, and it was just so much fun. And, and before this, it, uh, it seems to be sort of an explosion now of this era with uh, with uh, the Star Wars comic book series. How for, how aware were you of that series uh, evolving as you were writing Razor's Edge? 
I got to see uh, some of the scripts for the comics. I think they were they were had. I'm not sure when they started working on those compared to when I started working on the book, but I got to see some of the early scripts for the first three or four books. So that was really cool too to get to see the see, see those early. It's very. And it, were you at all concerned with how they would interlock, or did you get any kind of direction from Lucasfilm about that? No, not not really. But when I was reading them, I thought the the, the portrayal they were doing of Leia really matched with what I was doing, so I wasn't too worried about that. I agree, and and I'm a little biased because we we've had the good fortune of interacting with you a lot uh, on email and Twitter over the last few months. But I think yours is a much stronger portrayal for for a lot of reasons, really. But I'm sure that you had a lot of challenges, especially being such a big Leia fan and a Star Wars fan. But what are your, some of your biggest challenges writing the novel? Well, I just wanted to get I wanted to get her right, and I wanted to um, really go deeply into the issue of how she felt about Alderaan, and that's kind of it's such a big thing. And it, I mean, I and it, I think it's really hard for basically somebody like me to contemplate. I've never had a huge disaster like that in my life, and the idea that it's not only She's not only lost her family, but she's lost basically everyone she knew and her, and in a large extent, the plan, you know, the culture of the planet and everything that was familiar. And, and, and it's just a, it's just such a monumental loss. And so you want to try to get into what that must feel like writing a character who's recovering from that or trying to recover from it. But you also have to remember that it's an action novel and you don't want to you know, bog it down too much. You want to make the character feel feel realistic and like she you know and like she's experiencing these things, but you don't want to make it all about that. Sure. You want you don't want to stay free of the Bella angst and yeah. where everyone is constantly, <laughs> you know, yeah, hiding and sad and time because of these things that have happened and Yeah, exactly. Well it's it's neat for me to hear that that's the approach you took because Really, when you watch A New Hope, even though we know that Alderaan explodes and she loses everyone that she loves, you know, a few moments later she doesn't miss a beat. It's an action film. But your novel has this amazing ability of showing that Leia kept it all inside because it reminds me actually of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. When the Green Knight shows up, he frightens everyone and Arthur is frightened, but he keeps it inside because he knows he has to be calm because he's a leader and everyone looks to him. Leia is such a strong figure and one of the stronger female role models and heroines in all of literature. So the fact that you dive into that and still let her be tough and vulnerable at the same time is a real strength, I think. Oh, oh good. I'm glad that I'm glad you feel that way. Um, that is what I was trying to do. I want. I knew that since she is the leader. She and she's the only leader there in the in in the the group that this she's with. It's so incumbent on her to try to stay calm for everybody else. I mean, you know, you don't really have a chance to show vulner- vulnerability. But I wanted to being able to write from her perspective. You can show it from from in her own thoughts. Yeah, that her, the, that I see that too as part of the driving force of her character. She has to stay strong for everyone else. Mm-hmm. And, and you see that vulnerability that you know sometimes she doesn't really want to, but. She doesn't really have a choice. At least that's how she perceives it, which which adds some depth and dimension to her. Yeah, it just sort of comes out involuntarily sometimes. The the depth you go into with these characters is so well done, and I, I, I can't imagine the mindset you had to have to be able to get into that because it is a difficult thing to do, I think, because you, like you said, I mean, you kind of wrapped up into the comic books that were out at the time and obviously our mindset going into it uh, what did you what did you do to get in that in those in those characters' heads as far as decisions they are making or um, you know obviously some of the emotions they're going through how did that how did that work for you? Well, um, it's kind of the same way as when I write my original characters, and I know these characters so well. I mean, it's like I I, I feel like I grew up with these characters, so uh, like I'm a lot of other people my age did who were big Star Wars fans. So it's it really wasn't that difficult. It's sort of like I, I watched um, A New Hope again to kind of get you know back into it. It had been a while since I watched it. I just it, They just sort of all fell right back into place. Because I, I just spent so much time as a high school student and a college student, you know, writing fanfic and talking to people about Star Wars and, you know, my friends and everything. And we played, you know, the records and we did this and we, you know, we read all the, you know, the, the few books that were available, the Brian Daly books and that, you know, that were written back then. So it wasn't, it wasn't really hard to kind of get back into that world. I think too, when I was reading this book, 
I didn't know what to expect at first um, because um, I, I, I didn't know much about it. And as I began to read it, uh, we obviously, obviously got back into these characters, and I had this feeling kind of covered me. I, I've been watching the, the new uh, the Battlestar Galacta that came out a couple of years ago, and oh, yeah. it, it reminded me of that a little bit. Kind of like these these friends and these group of survivors are almost you know on their own going through space, the unknown, and all they have is each other. And I, I it really kind of went back to that. And I was like, wow, she's really pulls off really well. So kudos to you. That was really good. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> well, is that actually? I'm I'm happy that he brought that up. I didn't, I didn't make that connection. Shame on me being a literature teacher, <laughs> a teacher literature not making that connection. But Martha is Battlestar Galactica. Are you a fan of that? Is there's some interesting characters in there? I could definitely see you writing uh, some Battlestar Galactica fiction as well. Well, I watched it when um, when it first came on, the first version of it um, years ago, and um, it was one of my favorite shows, and. Um, I think I was just the right age for when it hit, and uh, then we went the the new version. Uh, uh, I watched that with my with my friend, my husband, and my friends, and we enjoyed that a lot. I also think the uh, the, the idea of a group isolated, you know, by themselves in some in a situation like that in space is also Stargate Atlantis too, which was again one of my you know Stargate yep. S one yep. was one mm-hmm. of my big favorites, and Atlantis I think I enjoyed even more. So yeah, that is kind of a scenario I like with a. Uh, with a sort of a, a group that's where everyone has to depend on each other. It's kind of a found family. And so that's, that is something I really like to do. And that's probably one of the reasons why I wanted to, to set the book like this instead of on a rebel base or something, I wanted to set it with a smaller group of people basically. Well, and in hearing you describe it too, it made me realize the connection to Firefly as well. Yeah. Firefly is another favorite. Yeah. Well, and and you know, being a big Star Wars fan and writing fan fiction and things of that nature, you know what the Star Wars community, what Star Wars fandom is like, and the expectations. And when when word got out that there was going to be a Princess Leia centered novel, um, I'm sure uh, it's it clearly you're a talented writer. But if it were me, I would think, oh my goodness, there are a lot of people that are expecting a lot out of this, especially when it comes with the characterization of of Han, Luke, and Leia. Uh, Corey and I have talked a lot about this, how how a lot of expanded universe novels that come out, they don't always catch our eye when it comes to the original trilogy because I don't always feel like people capture the essence of those characters. But you pulled it off beautifully. How did you approach that and with all those big expectations that were out there? Well, thank you. And um, it was very nerve wracking. I was very worried about that. Uh, I don't remember feeling particularly confident about it at all. But the you know the more I wrote them, again the, again the more familiar it felt to me. It felt like just familiar ground once I got back into it, because you know I was I was such a huge fan, and really I spent so much time, you know you know thinking about these characters and coming up with stories for them. You know through the whole you know probably about ten years it was it it was a big fandom for me at least ten years actively. And then um, I got out of it for a bit and then ended up getting back into it when uh, fandom started to move more onto the Internet. So I was able to talk to a lot of my friends, you know, in email and, and on mailing lists a lot. So we kind of got, got I got back more into Star Wars again. Yeah, it was just again, it just felt like these were such familiar characters. I, I won't say it was easy, but um, it was not as hard as I thought it was going to be getting back into it. It just kind of everything just kind of fell into place again. Well, I, I can't help but wonder too, hearing you say that, uh, how much of of what we see in Razor's Edge are concepts or ideas that you had uh, kind of before through your fan fiction or other things that just you got a chance to show the world, or was it all just kind of things that came to you as you were as you were composing the narrative? Not really that much because I I don't think I'd ever really I hadn't ever really done a space pirate idea like that before. I wanted it, that was new for me, so I wanted to do that. I never done the mining. Uh, you know, calling the idea before, and I never really, you know, done the the small group of rebels together. Um, it was all pretty new. So um, the main thing I'd done before was writing, basically, you know, Han and Leah on you know their friendship and their their relationship, their kind of burgeoning relationship. So I'd done that before, but everything, you know, all the plot and all the the, the things they encounter and the other the other original characters are all new. I think too is you, like we said too. You've done a great job with these characters, and like you said, it, it is a big to be able to write these characters. They're such they're held in such high esteem as far as the fandom goes. 
the connection the three big characters I have, especially Han and Leia, and the, the romantic tension there that is there. I, is there things you could do but couldn't do because of you know off of what we'd see in the films? And also, I mean, was there things that you uh, basically just couldn't write? Well, I couldn't um, because of just the, the time period it was set in. You know, you couldn't take the relationship too far. It was kind of, I wanted to show just sort of the cusp of when they were, their friendship is becoming more solid and they're really getting to trust each other. And that was really the moment I was going for um, with, with a little bit of the sexual tension beginning to start up. But yeah, just because of the timing, I really couldn't go any further than that. Uh, since we know from Empire Strikes Back, you know, it's a bit nebulous as to how, you know, close they are at that point. If they've ever, if they've actually, you know, if he's actually kissed her before, that's the first time we're seeing. So I didn't want to get any, any closer to that territory since that's really, you know, we're not really sure about that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and that, and that is, a, that is a very fine line that again, it, um, it's, it's definitely the Martha Wells love fest here at Coffee with Kenobi because <laughs> I'm telling you, uh, when I read expanded universe stuff from the original trilogy, I'm so critical of it. And you did you balance that thing with Han and Leia perfectly because you can't give away too much because the Empire Strikes Back is really the big coming out party for their relationship and their passion for another yeah. that clearly has been building below the surface and you hint to it and then you think highly enough of your readers to know that we're going to be able to read between the lines and know what's coming. And it's actually a great way to build tension. I wish you had talked um, to the Twilight author, um, just for the, the way you do the slow reveal that actually builds toward the characters without making them all soft. It, 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 I think that's a big thing that I always run into when, I, when you're reading um, fiction that has an element of romance to it. Sometimes people don't understand the powers and the subtlety and then the emotion and just the way you interact with how they glance at one another or how they you can tell that they want to brush by one another. I thought that was really, really well done. So thank you again for thinking highly enough of your readers to write it in that particular style. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm not a particularly romantic author when I write, when I do write romantic relationships. I've had people kind of criticize me for that, that they thought, you know, they didn't understand if it was a romantic relationship or not with some of the characters. So um, I, I kind of prefer things to be more subtle and to, to stay for the Absolutely. characters, to stay in character, you know. So that's kind of been one of my preferences, even for my other books. So, but, well, well, but thank you. <laughs> absolutely. And, and that's the thing, too. You, you have to you put it out there for people to think about, but make people think about what's going on. Don't spoon feed them. And it was yeah. it was really well done. Well, thank you. Well, we talked about too is like you said, Star Wars. You know, books are majority for action, adventure, uh, stories, and like you said, to me, it was more of a character-driven book. Uh, but you did have the action there, and uh, it kind of described to us kind of how you played out the action a little bit. I know there's some kind of some shootouts and some space battles and things like that. And I don't want to give away too much for folks maybe who haven't read it yet. But uh, how did you approach those? Oh, well, I've always, uh, I've done a lot of action uh, in my other books. Um, it's mostly been more uh, sword fighting and, and, you know, fist fighting and that kind of action. Uh, with the Stargate Atlantis books, they do have uh, the P90s and everything. So that's, you know, that's a, you have to think about the fights differently. The, the scale mm-hmm. sort of really uh, goes up. I've done, you know, magical battles in some of the books. And with the Raxura books, they're actually flying shapeshifters with teeth and claws. So that's a whole different sort of battle there. <laughs> so I've done a lot of different types of it. So again, that wasn't much different from the kind of action I'd written before. You just kind of have to remember, you know, you're dealing with energy weapons and what that's going to be like and what the damage is going to be and, and you know, how many people need to be in the scene and, and that kind of thing. So it's just, it's it's more like you have to think about the different logistics. Yeah, it's a, yeah definitely the, the way you pace it and plot it out and and it, while Razor's Edge is out there, and it, it's a fairly new book, um, what are some other of, of your more recent novels? You mentioned some of them, but what are some other novels that fans who are, are enjoying your writing through Razor's Edge uh, can gravitate towards? Well, the the books of the Rex are all all three of them are out now. Uh, the Cloud Roads, the uh, Serpent Sea, and the Siren Depths. And the Siren Depths just came out last December. Uh, they're in trade paperback, and audiobook, and ebook. 
And also there's like an ebook bundle of the three of them that's available from the publisher. And uh, they're a fantasy series set in a completely created world, again, with shapeshifters who are sort of um, part human, part sort of demony, dragony people. And um, those are uh, some of my favorite books I've ever written. I'm really enjoying writing those. And uh, the others that are the more recent others is uh, Emily in the Hollow World, which is a young adult fantasy that's sort of steampunkish in a in a created world, oh. and it just came out in April. And uh, there's a sequel, Emily in the Sky World, that's coming out next March, and those are from uh, Strange Chemistry, which is an imprint of Angry Robot Books. And so those are two of the most recent, and I'm doing some novellas that are also set in the books of the Rexera world. And I'm not sure when the first one's going to be out yet. The, there's going to be four total, and I've turned the first one into the publisher, and I'm about to finish the second one. So I'm not sure when those are going to be coming out. It sounds that's those sound awesome. Those sound very very cool. And we have a lot of listeners who are well read, and I know that when they hear you talking about this, they're gonna they're going to be interested because it sounds like you've got some really cool things going on there. At the end of uh, the book, there's a little excerpt uh, of the next Star Wars Empire Rebellion: Honor Among Thieves by James S. A. Corey. And uh, I, I don't know if you can divulge a little bit to for us, uh, maybe possibly that uh, any Star Wars novels that could be coming out uh, from you or from any uh, your, of the, the series uh, that will be coming out soon. Well, I'm not planning to do another Star Wars novel. I know the uh, uh, the Corey novel is coming out uh, pretty pretty soon, I think. So I'm really looking forward to that one in particular. And I know there's a third Empire and Rebellion novel that's going to be featuring luke mm-hmm. so that should be really good too well i was actually going to ask you um when you're writing razor's edge knowing this is uh the first part of a trilogy how much does the story of razor's edge connect to the other two books i'm not sure how much you're a liberty to say but how much of the connection is there i i don't really know because i know i we didn't we weren't collaborating with each other I think they had in mind that would just be a different take on the Star Wars universe by by three authors who um, were normally science fiction and fantasy authors. So there wasn't really a plan for us to collaborate. It would be kind of cool if we'd been able to, but I think that it was a little bit too much, um, you know, too difficult to work that out uh, since they wanted did want the books fairly quickly. It would have been nice, but yeah, it, it didn't happen. I always wondered about that, how they were connecting the three. And, and so I appreciate your insights into that. No Star Wars books in your future right now? No, not right now. Get back to fantasy is really my first love, so I want to really get back into that more. That makes sense. And well, I, I'm sure your readers will appreciate that because uh, just the way you're telling us now about how these stories are developing sounds very, very exciting. Of course, though, since we are a Star Wars podcast, <laughs> we do hope that we will see you um, approach the Star Wars universe uh, sometime in the near future. I'd love to see you write uh, a Padme centered novel personally. Oh yeah, that would be kind of cool. <laughs> well, I was going to say I, I I was a little disappointed to hear that. I will say <laughs> that we don't see, hear anything from more from you. Maybe not. We don't know. We don't know. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know those Star Wars fans. <laughs> So, uh, and Martha, again, thank you so much uh, for being so generous with your time and listeners. She really was tremendous helping us. Uh, Corey and I, uh, all three of us, Martha, we all have very hectic schedules. So Martha was so willing to work with us and we appreciate that so much. And Martha, before we let you go, we do have five questions that we like to ask all of our guests here at Coffee with Kenobi. Um, they're just basic one word, one sentence kind of things, kind of quick hits to show the connectivity uh, with Star Wars fan and fandom and, and Star Wars celebrities like yourself. So uh, I'll go ahead and ask you the first one. What is your favorite Star Wars film? A uh, New Hope, definitely. Okay. Uh, your favorite Star Wars character? Leah. <laughs> Gee, okay, yeah. I'll kind of guess that, but yeah. let's go ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, what is your favorite line of dialogue or film moment? Oh, gosh. Actually, it's a Han moment when he's on the in the, the detention center and he's doing the whole, um, you know, we're all right here. How are oh, you? Yeah. <laughs> that was just such a, such a funny moment during, during that scene. But yeah, that one, that's it. It's like a star is born. You can see Harrison Ford coming into his own. The, the, yes, the season yes, that are there. Really can. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you collect, what is your favorite collectible that you own? Uh, I collect photos and I've got an autographed photo that has, um, Harrison Ford, Mark Hamill and Carrie Fisher on it. Oh, wow. 
Wow. I didn't get it in Does person. It, I, I bought it. I cheated and I bought it. But. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Did you get it signed? Is it signed? Yeah, it's, they're all autographed. Oh, wow, wow. That's, That's excellent. Awesome. I, I have a, a Harrison Ford Indiana Jones sign one, too, that I I uh, had to buy myself. But, yeah, what what a cool thing. Yeah. <laughs> I, love, I love collecting photos. So what particular messages or themes about the Star Wars saga resonate or speak to you? I think it was just the feeling that the universe was so limitless and anything could happen. And just that really, and that's what always kind of drew me to science fiction. And I think that's what I can, why I connected with Star Wars so strongly is just these, you know, this, this feeling that of the, not only the adventure, but just the sheer variety of what would be out there in this, in the, this world. And that just really, really um, resonated with me. That's great. I think it's so unique to see what, even fans and authors and, and just anybody who's a fan of the saga is what they kind of what they see and we love I love we love asking these questions but uh, I know our, we're kind of running our time here uh, but we want to give you uh, some time for yourself there but we want to let fans know how they can get in touch with you if they want to interact with you online or uh, best way to get a hold of you uh, my website is marthawells.com and uh, it has the links on it to my Twitter page. And uh, my live journal was kind of, was where I kind of had my blog. I'm on Tumblr a lot too, mostly reblogging well, with stuff your, with your, all your photos and stuff. Uh, yeah, I, that's I, great. And so, um, yeah, basically, my website is the best place to start from, and it's got the links to the other places. We'll definitely put a, a link to that in our show notes. And listeners, definitely, uh, thank you again, Martha Wells, so much for for coming on Coffee with Kenobi and, and sharing a cup of coffee with us. I hope I hope you enjoyed your coffee. It was a special brew. That we have for all of our guests here. <laughs> and um, again, listeners, if you haven't done so already, what are you waiting for? Go out and check out Razor's Edge and all of Martha Wells' other other great books that are out there. We will certainly feature links to them on the website as well as to Martha Wells' website at coffeewithkenobi.com. Thank you again, Martha, for being on our show. Thanks again, Martha. We really appreciate talking to you, and we look forward to see what you do next. Well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Our topic for show number nine is the proper viewing order in which to view Star Wars Saga. In what order do you think George Lucas' vision is properly presented? Does it matter if you are a first-time viewer or Star Wars veteran? How does it enhance or detract based on sequence? And how do you incorporate the Clone Wars? This is a perfect topic for us to have our good friend of our show, Craig Dickinson, as he incorporates this very ideology into his classroom setting. So we're really going to look at this. There are a number of theories about the correct order of how to view the Star Wars films. So please send in your thoughts and topics, and we'll be happy to share them on our next show. I like the sound of that. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited and is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names and sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney or their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi, unless otherwise indicated. There's no one here. Move along. Move along.